I Miss Wendy? Doing great. Specific or just cut a few calories? <laughs> <Okay. You know. laughs> I just kind of chocolate. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I don't know. So, uh, I just heard, uh, I'd seen him about six, eight weeks ago. He looked okay. He was kind of debilitated because he had that surgery. Was that yeah, right. So it wasn't exactly. Yeah. So mm-hmm. something happened over the next few weeks. And he, I think it's a neurologic. I guess we can both keep I tried to bear it. I just said that he just he couldn't figure it out. He'd seen a whole bunch of neurologists. He just progressive deterioration uh, intellectually as well as basically. And he told me he was going to the hospital. In oh, this is you. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. Was it with your church group? Or no, no, no. Just, just for fun. Just good to do. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Oh, okay. Um, before we start the presentation, balance disorders, I've asked uh, Gary Ayers just to give a tribute to um, his longtime partner and our longtime colleague, uh, Rick Johnson, who died about a week ago. The younger guys here probably never met him. He retired about... Oh, 2002 or so, but he was a stellar member of the uh, allergy community for, you know, 30, 40 years. Uh, the first thing I was asked, uh, well, what did he die of? And I, to be honest with you, I don't know. I had seen him probably six weeks ago. He had had surgery on his neck for some cervical spine disease and wasn't quite looking himself, but for some reason he had a significant and rapidly progressive deterioration to the point that they were putting him in a hospice. And this is just over weeks. So at any rate, I talked to his son the night that he died, and he said he'd seen multiple neurologists and physicians, and uh, they just couldn't figure out. And a lot, of, like a lot of those progressive neurologic syndromes, if he did have it, you can diagnose it, but you can't treat it. So at any rate, he was uh, born on May 5th, 1935 in Kelso, Washington. He died on October 7, 2015. That was last Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Uh, with his family by his side. However, his son was with me pressing grapes. And one of uh, Rick's great uh, things that he loved in life was uh, making wine. And that it was sad that he wasn't there uh, for the last pressing. He was born May 5th, as I said, in 1935 in Kelso, Washington. He was a lover of sports. He played high school basketball and baseball. And Jim Stroh's not here, but those guys played squash well into their 60s. And I may be uh, shorting them a bit because it may have been into their 70s. He attended WSU where he majored in zoology, and he was Phi Beta Kappa there. And he graduated in 1957, but was a rabid cougar his whole life. uh, And... uh, and loved his coups, but he did have season tickets to the Huskies a little bit closer to home. He went to the University of Washington Medical School from 1957 to 61, and he was very active in the Medical Alumni Association, as was I. He was a class representative for 20 years like I was, because could never get anybody to take the place. But he was very active there. And in 1960, while he was in medical school, he married Peggy, he actually knew her in Kelso in junior high, but they weren't dating then. But she was a school teacher in Bellevue at the time, and they were married. He, they were married for a total of 55 years, and had three children, uh, David, uh, Baird, and Kaisa, and seven grandkids. Uh, actually, Baird is a good friend because we make uh, wine together, and we did with his dad all those years. He did his residency for two years at Philadelphia General, and he spent... Uh, he came back for two years in Seattle. He did his allergy fellowship at the U of Dub here with uh, Dr. Paul Van Arsdale. Uh, ironically, they're very few people. Well, Al probably remembers them, you know, but a lot of the younger people have no idea who Paul Van Arsdale was. But he was one of the, he, in fact, I think he was the first uh, head of the allergy division here. Is that right, Bill? Mm-hmm. Correct. Uh, he eventually uh, did what uh, a lot of uh, us do. He became a fellow in the American Academy of Allergy, and he was a fellow in the American College of Physicians as an internist. He, uh, at, at that time, again, uh, young guys don't know this, but you had a military responsibility, and he had, had to go two years as a physician in the Air Force in Illinois. 
He knew everything about all the uh, jets. Uh, when one would fly overhead, he'd tell you what it was and what the size of its engine was. He practiced internal medicine with Bill Watts Sr. and Harold King at first, but then in 1974, he joined uh, Jim Stroh uh, to form Allergy and Asthma Associates, uh, which I'm a member of, and he was a partner of mine for over two decades. Subsequent members included Art Sprinkle, who ended up uh, staying just briefly and, and uh, went up to Everett to practice. Is Art still practicing? Anyhow. I was a, a second uh, member. Susan Marshall, who became a dean at the medical school, was uh, with us a few years. And then Chuck, Chuck Jackson came along. He is uh, basically retired, although he still has a clinic in Alaska. Other partners included Bob Webb. Harvey Milbrock, and uh, uh, most recently, uh, Kevin Dooms. Actually, when uh, uh, Rick retired, he, he retired along with Harvey Milbrock, and he, they sold the Seattle part of the practice because I was over here on the east side, and it was bought by Pandora Christie, uh, who obviously is known as an allergist. He was very active politically uh, uh, for the rest of us. He did the jobs that none of the rest of us want to do. He uh, worked his way up through the Washington State Medical Association, became president of the organization. He was also a chairman of the board of Physicians Insurance and was a member of the Washington State uh, Medical Disciplinary Board. He was a clinical professor at the UW and he ran the allergy clinic at Harborview Medical Center for many years. He was also involved in community service he was a board member of United Way and Planned Parenthood, not a popular uh, position, but he had strong convictions about uh, uh, Planned Parenthood and uh, staunchly defended them. He was a member of Seattle Rotary and another very impressive statistic, he gave over 100 units of blood. I would be remiss if I didn't mention his activity here in Journal Club. He was one of the staunchest supporters and was a regular attendee, and there are just a few people that have attended this many times. Al's getting up there. He's been around a long time, so at any rate. He had his passions, especially in his youth. He loved to go backpacking and hiking in the Cascades in the Olympics. He went up to the Brooks Range several, several times in uh, Alaska. It didn't sound like much fun to me because he just said he got swarmed by mosquitoes the whole time, but I guess the scenery was spectacular. Uh, when he couldn't do those physical activities in his maturity, he would take trips with his wife Peggy and going to the Coxwolds, Cornwall, Burgundy, Tuscany. He actually did the Grand Canyon as well. Like I said, another major passion of his is winemaking, which he did for close to a half century. And he did it with other illustrious allergists. Uh, uh, many are deceased now, uh, but uh, are, are well known, including Warren Bierman. Bill Pearson and Gail Shapiro, which they were all members of NAC, but they are all deceased now. Uh, Stan Zeitz is still active uh, winemaker well into his 80s, and we press the grapes at his house when we make our wine. Cliff Burakawa used to be a member of the wine group until he got a bit snooty and likes higher class wines than we make. <laughs> Jim Stroh and, and myself are still very active in the uh, process, and like I said, I was, we were pressing grapes the night of his death. He also loved his second home at, home at Hartstein Island. Uh, uh, he entertained family and friends. He would have us down every year overnight for a weekend down there. And we'd go sailing and kayaking. And he loved taking the care of his grandkids down there as well. One of his last projects was uh, refurbishing an old boat. I don't know whether he finished it. Just a few final remarks and a summary about Rick. He uh, was a fine clinician. He was loved by his patients and, and actually loved by his employees, which a lot of people aren't. Uh, and, and he was respected by his colleagues. I mentioned his laudable achievements, both academically and professionally, and he was very active in community services, as I mentioned. Most importantly to me, though, is he was a great guy. He was fun to be around, he was always upbeat, he was smart, witty, and as a, lot, a result, he had loads of friends and admirers. He was a gregarious guy, always out doing things with his friends. Although we send our deepest condolences to his wife Peggy and his three children and his seven grandkids, 
he lived a great life and was admired. I, I feel very fortunate to have known the man, to have been his friend and colleague, and I was one of his many admirers, and uh, he will truly be missed. There will be a celebration of his life on Saturday, October 24th, from 2 to 4 p.m. It'll be at the Horizon House, and the address is there. I think you can find it online. Uh, he, I, like I said, will be missed. I don't know if any other people have any comments they want to make about him. Gary, thanks very much. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're going to switch out the computer. So for those of you on the outside of the screen, I'll go blank for a second. Don't panic. <laughs> What's the record here this year? They should they still have audio. Uh, yeah, we should. Yeah. All right, so our speaker for the morning, Dr. Michael Malahan, is going to talk about uh, balance disorders as soon as we get the technology working. I lost my Good morning, my name is Mike Malahan. I'm an audiologist at the Hearing and Balance Lab up in Mill Creek. I've been in practice now going on 34 years. I practice in the otolaryngology clinic with uh, Pat Lynch for 14 years. He was a great mentor and a huge inspiration. I now have been in practice in Mill Creek uh, for 20 years. I see newborn infants to adults for hearing and balance related diagnostic evaluations. Um, I also see patients for Amplification services. <clears throat> uh, one disclosure, living in the North End, you never know what the traffic is going to be like coming down to Seattle in the morning. It could be 25 minutes, it could be an hour and a half. Uh, in my uh, attempt to come down here on time, I left my hearing aid sitting in the bathroom, so uh, <laughs> just full disclosure. So if you ask a question, I'd like to will not be able to answer it if you're a woman speaking in a soft voice. I'm also a Seattle Sounders uh, fan and uh, have no countenance for Corbin Timbers people. <laughs> Just disclosing that. So balance disorders. It actually is a big deal and I am kept very busy seeing all kinds of varieties of patients, both pediatric and adults, for assessment. Hopefully uh, guidance towards treatment and hopefully an eventual solution. But not all balance orders can be fixed. Balance disorders can be life-changing and they can be uh, quite disabling. Uh, happens to a lot of folks. It happened to me. And I have great empathy for the patients that I see that had the problem I had. Um, it's, a, it's a big expense too. A lot of people that have a sudden onset of vertigo are carted off the hospital, they run under a bunch of different exams, spend a lot of money and told to go home and take meclizine and hopefully it'll get better. So four to six thousand dollars to spend on that visit when probably uh, no visits necessary. People are, are hospitalized and spend time uh, in care without uh, necessarily, typically 90% don't do, or do not benefit from treatment in the hospital. Here's the bad news. Like everything else, as we get older, our balance system, uh, the your equilibrium becomes affected. And it's affected in, in different areas. Um, the wiring is not as sharp. Uh, our connections are not as good. We have proprioceptive and visual changes and also distributor changes over time. And in order to maintain good and accurate balance, you need good input from all three systems. So equilibrium is maintained by input from what our eyes tell our brain, what our body tells our brain, and what our vestibular system tells our brain. The vestibular system is in a very dense area in the temporal bone, very well protected, and is formed very early on embryologically, in the fourth week of gestation, the beginning of the vestibular system is formed. So it's formed before other body parts. Very important function. 
What our vision tells our brain about our position in space is it tells our brain about where we are. It gives us a depth of field where we are relative to other objects. And also uh, tells where our head is relative to our torso. And that then uses that information. Proprioception is our muscle skeletal system, our lower motor trunk communication system, and sends information to our brain about our body position in space and where our body is relative to our head. The vestibular system contains two senses. One, the semicircular canals, and the other, the otolith organ. The semicircular canals are oriented in three planes of space. They are full of fluid. At the end of each canal is a gate. As we move our head from side to side, side, the fluid displaces those cupolas, those gates, and sends a signal to our brain, which then moves our eyes. So our ears move our eyes when our head is in, in movement. When the head is still, the three planes of orientation of semicircular canals are firing a spontaneous uh, signal. So it's going boom, boom, boom. When we turn our head to the right side, the lateral canal fires faster, the opposite left lateral canal fires slower, and that difference tells the brain we're turning our head to the right, and it moves our eyes to the left. If you take your, your guide there and look at it and shake your head back and forth, the image stays in focus. If you then move that, the camera back and forth and hold your head still, it blurs. So your eyes are not fast enough on their own to maintain a stable image when your head's in motion. Your ears control your eyes. The next sensor is the otolith organ. And it's, uh, as I describe it to patients, it's two catcher's mitts, one oriented laterally and one oriented vertically. Embedded in that mitt are little electrical switches. On top of that is a bed of jello. On top of that are oticonia, calcium carbonate crystals that sit on top of the bed of jello. It gives our brain gravitational referencing, but also tells the brain about our, the plane of head movement and the linear acceleration of our head in space. When we move forward or side to side or up and down, the rocks impinge upon that jello, causing electrical switches to fire. That then sends a signal to our muscle skeletal system and contracts muscles on our neck to adjust our head position relative to our torso. So that when we're moving around in space, the otolith organ orients our head over our torso. And the brain believes the vestibular system more than it believes anything else. It believes no matter what our eyes tell our brain, no matter what our body tells our brain, the vestibular system controls everything. And sometimes it's incorrect. For example, our eyes lie. Our eyes don't always tell the brain exactly where we are. It doesn't tell our brain everything. Our eyes are always looking for a fixation point to lock onto. As you look there on the screen, how many black dots can you count? If you move your head back and forth, it changes also. There are no black dots on that screen. If you move your head from side to side or tilt it back and forth and stare at that black dot in the center, things are moving when they actually are not moving. <laughs> so our eyes lie. <coughs> so what happens with the aging uh, balance system, and, I, and I'll go back and, and make a comment. I was in Washington, D.C. At, at a meeting and submitted my slides and then realized I submitted the wrong slides, so um, 
I'll have to follow on with my discussion and make any corrections if you need to. So the aging balance, uh, balance system, depending on visual input, well, as we get older, things change in our vision. Obviously, after age 40, we need more uh, help with our vision. We're reading things close up, and that changes orientation in the distance. There are things that affect people as they age that come on and affect the, the vision. And when you get reduced vision, your equilibrium suffers. Proprioceptive input losses, particularly in patients suffering from uh, neuropathy, um, cervical changes, and also medical changes. Diabetes causes a change in communication between upstairs and downstairs. And that makes a big difference in your ability to move about in space and your proprioceptive orientation to your brain. And that affects a lot of things. Same thing happens with our vestibular input. As we age, the sensors within the vestibular system, the connections become less and less. The rocks start uh, coming off the jello, and the cupula becomes less responsive to uh, orientation. So when we move our head, it's not as quick on the, on the movement. Also, what can happen is from earlier uh, issues in life, or from Contact sports uh, from slips and falls and smacking your head can also change input to the uh, vestibular system that, that acts in a permanent manner. I think you mentioned that and you love soccer. Um, it seems like hitting your head all the time with a soccer ball would not be good for this system. Um. <laughs> so an inappropriate comment from the group. <laughs> Regarding soccer and the challenges with, uh, with head injuries and impact in your skull, uh, that does bring up a very good point. Uh, however, the, um, I'll say 10% of that impact is, is affecting our system. But it is, it is an issue, as in any, any contact sport. Hitting a soccer ball in soccer with your head is not the problem. It's hitting your head against another player's head, which causes the majority of the, the problems affecting soccer players. So if you think about football players, American football, they have a, obviously a significantly more uh, challenge and impact later in life due to chronic uh, contact, whether it's concussions or otherwise. But yes, soccer players do suffer uh, vestibular problems. So let's talk about what goes wrong with the vestibular system. I already talked about what goes wrong with our eyes as we age. Uh, other things occur with our vision is uh, over time and impact things. Other things happen proprioceptively. In the vestibular system, things happen and when they go bad, things are really bad. So one of the things that happen and happened to myself is you get an inflammatory problem that occurs that causes an inflammation around the sheath, around the nerve supplying information from the vestibular system. And it usually is unilateral. So when you choke off one of the supply signals to the brain, what the brain interprets is that you're spinning around in a circle. So as I talked about earlier, the vestibular system in without movement is sending a static response going boom, boom, boom. It tells our brain that we're not moving our head. When you get vestibular neuritis, you choke off the information center, it stops firing. What does the brain interpret? The guy on the right side doesn't know there's a problem over on the left, and he's sending the signal to your brain, boom, boom, boom. The brain thinks you're turning to the right, and therefore moves your eyes to the left and keeps moving your eyes to the left, and you get on a merry-go-round that you can't get off. You get a sense of turning around and spinning around in a circle. And that doesn't stop. It will last at a minimum a week, at a maximum a month, 
and potentially persistently for years. The brain is not recognizing that the vestibular system is sending bad data. So it causes, obviously, it causes what is truly vertigo, a sense of turning when you're not. So when patients say they have vertigo, it's, um, it's got to be a true sense of turning around in space. Not woozy lightheaded, not heavy headed, not loopy, but vertigo is a true sense of turning around in space. And if it's truly a vestibular problem, they have they feel better when they close their eyes. If it's a more central problem, a disconnection between downstairs and upstairs, they get a sense of the world turning, eyes open or eyes closed. So in, in later stages, when a patient comes in complaining of vertigo, if they feel better when they close their eyes, that gives you a clue that it's most likely an inner ear problem and not a central issue. After a period of time, the brain recognizes from input from the other two systems that oh, the, perhaps the vestibular system isn't telling the truth. And therefore, it starts working at trying to repair that discord. And interestingly enough, when it does recognize the problem, and the neuritis continues on, you may lose complete function on that side, but the brain, through, move, through compensation, then shuts down, it becomes less alerted to what the right side is saying. Even though the right side is still functioning fine, it's trying to rebalance and reset the mark. The way the brain does that is through experience. So a patient has got to get up and start moving. The sooner the better. Unsedated. Now, a patient comes in complaining of vertigo, the first thing they want to do is get off the merry-go-round. So many and most physicians in primary care throw medication at them. Meclizine, Valium, Scopolamine, they throw medication at the patient. That is rarely helpful. It's a temporary crutch. And the better advice to the patient is tough it out, get up and walk around. Walk around outside and keep your eyes open. Because when, you're, when your brain is getting input proprioceptively and visually, it now is placing an argument that says, yep, your vestibular system isn't giving the right data. So when this happened to me, I knew what was going on. I was miserable, spinning like a top for a month. Day number two, day number one, I couldn't get out of bed. Day number two, I forced myself to get up and walk around. I could walk for five minutes, and then I had to lay down for an hour to recover from that five minutes of activity. And over a week's time, I worked up to the point where my wife could drive me to the office so I could see patients that were feeling not as bad as I was. So I would see patients in my office spinning around like a top, and some of the tests that I do, I could not watch because it would, would cause more of a problem. Bottom line for your patients is, get up, start moving, and stay off the medication. The medication is a neurosuppressant. It's like drinking alcohol and trying and by drinking more alcohol is going to make you walk better. It never worked for me in college, and not as, a, as an adult so side. Thank you. Do you have any exercises help at all for this? No. What? This is truly, so we'll talk about epi exercises. But if you have vestibular neuritis, it is a functional performance problem that requires the brain reset. Epley maneuver is treated for something else I'll talk about here shortly. 
5. So the, the key questions you should ask your patient, are you dizzy, do you have vertigo all the time or only when you move your head? This needs to be all the time. Does it happen when you move your head in only certain positions? When you put your head up like this or when you roll over in bed, does it happen? That's something different altogether, and I'll talk about that shortly. But vestibular neuritis, you're on the merry-go-round you can't get off. It doesn't matter what you do, it doesn't make things better. The only thing that makes it better is lying still with your eyes closed, and you're still miserable for a little bit there. If this is a viral, theoretically, if it's a viral infection, there should be some receptor target. Why would you have one side get attacked and not the other if it's truly a viral-mediated illness? That's a good question. I don't have an answer for it. But it, it is, I'm going to say 90% of the time, it is a unilateral phenomenon. What about prednisone? It is rare that it's bilateral. Do you put them on prednisone? take down the inflammation, or does that not work? Prednisone has been not found to be helpful for this treatment. Now, prednisone, when you, you, can have, you can have vestibular neuritis, but it also can affect both the auditory and the vestibular nerve. As you can see in the drawing, there's, there's three nerves coming to form the eighth nerve. Two of them come from the vestibular system. One of them comes from the cochlea, the hearing mechanism. So if the inflammatory process occurs further down, it's going to affect all three sensors, the otolith, the semicircuit canals, and the cochlea. When that happens, it appears that prednisone is very helpful in reducing the consequences for the cochlea. It does not seem to have a significant benefit for the vestibule. You may be going to talk about this, but what about the prevention of motion sickness, a re related phenomenon? Or uh, those drugs you talked about, do you recommend any of those for prevention, like on a cruise or anything like that? When going on a cruise, they would be that may be appropriate, but also a uh, scotch wouldn't help, wouldn't hurt either. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, scopolamine is, is very effective for suppressing the, uh, the discordant response. When you're on a ship, your vestibular system is getting a completely different sense than what proprioceptive and vision is. If you remember as a kid, when you get off a merry-go-round, you get off a merry-go-round, your eyes tell your brain you're standing still. Your body tells your brain you're standing still. Your vestibular system, due to inertia of fluid movement, tells your brain you're still on the merry-go-round. And so things are moving around. So when you're on board a ship and you're walking around on the ship, experience tells you that, that as you're walking in a hallway, the world is stable. But your vestibular system is on the ship. Your body and your eyes are in a building. And experience tells you that that does not move but your vestibular system gets the conflict. And that's where you get the you get the nausea. It's not vertigo that's produced on the on board the ship. It's a it's a disconnect from the three sensors. And by putting the scopolamine on, it suppresses the vestibular response, but gives you less orientation in that mark, and therefore what your vision your and your proprioception do not have as much of a conflict. So scopolamine, meclizine, bonine, those help suppress the vestibular response. That's a very bad idea to take those when you're in this crisis. Doesn't that sound like fun? How do uh, ice skaters and dancers deal with spinning around so often and focusing? How do, how do they deal with not getting dizzy? They are very adept at picking a focal point to lock onto as they're turning, so that gives their system reference to where they are in space. So they're able to suppress the movement of the vestibular system by locking onto that, onto, onto an object, 
off in the distance. If you think about, if you, uh, here's another visual distortion problem. People that have some balance problems have no problem going upstairs because their vision is locking on to a spot. They, they know their depth of field when they're walking up the stairs because they have ability to lock on it. When you go downstairs, your vision is drawn forward and you are actually are oriented to move forward to get a lock on your depth of field, to focus on a distant object. And that sends a signal to your brain that moves your torso forward. If your vestibular system is not working well, it doesn't make that correction, and you actually are pulled forward. You think about if you have a fear of heights, you go to the edge of a building, you feel like you're falling off because your vision is telling your brain to, to move forward, to lock on and fixate on that object in the distance. That's why you feel like you're being pulled off the, the skyscraper, because your brain is telling you to move forward. That causes you to become loopy. Another common problem that occurs that you may see in your practice, particularly an allergy, because this is caused by an allergic response, called Meniere's disease or endolymphatic high drops. So endolymphatic high drops is, is not clearly understood, but it is an overproduction of endolymphatic fluid within the system that that communicates both with the cochlea and the vestibular system. Same fluid. You get too much fluid through a pressure change, that then causes distortion within the system. And now you have a higher media that the cupula needs to work with then. It causes a decrease in hearing, a roaring noise in the ear, and when you're at the top of the track, it causes a, a break of the, the barrier between endolymph and paralymph. One has high potassium, one high, has high sodium. When you mix the two together, they don't work well together, and it causes a vestibular storm. It makes you start spinning on the ear that's affected. So endolymphatic high drops is an allergic reaction to something. It, it may be a food most commonly associated with a higher degree of sodium intake. So if you're eating a lot of salty foods, you're more likely to have an incident. But people that are on, on a low salt diet can have this problem come on and it's an allergic reaction to something and we're not completely sure what causes it. And there's a lot of arguments about that. We have no evidence in the allergy field that's an allergic reaction, though. That's the argument. Well, they do. I think that that's taught, it's taught by all the ENT programs that it must be an allergy, but there really is no substantive evidence to support that. I just right. thought, no, from an allergist point of view. In fact, we'd say it's a non-allergic problem. And there's the rub. <laughs> What we do know is that people that have what's called secondary endolymphatic high drops is that if they eat small meals throughout the day and they moderate their sugar and salt intake, the storms become less violent and it is actually a management of the patient. Something's causing this to come on. Obviously, we don't completely understand it. We actually can't agree on a way of measuring this. Um, and a lot of people are diagnosed with this inappropriately. You don't have to have all three components at the same time. Right, and there's, there's primary endolymphatic high drops, which is called Meniere's disease, named after Prosper Meniere, a famous French photolaryngologist. And the, and the triad of symptoms, there are actually four symptoms, roaring noise in the ear, spinning dizziness, so vertigo, a decrease in hearing, and the fourth is a fullness or a plugged up sensation in that ear. And it is, majority of the time, a unilateral phenomenon. But you can have vestibular symptoms 
and it's diagnosed as Meniere's disease, when in fact, we're finding that the majority of those diagnosed as Meniere, vestibular Meniere's, they have a migraine subvariant called the vestibular migraine. And treatment in that is very successful. I take it this is just a clinical diagnosis. You don't measure pressure. You can't see anything on an MRI, can you? You can't see anything on an MRI. Uh, the diagnosis is very accurately made on autopsy. <laughs> so you can. But there are, there are measurements that you can make when the patient is symptomatic. When the patient comes to my office, I can record, which is called, if, which is a difference in a wave one. So it's an evoked response. We take a look at how their ear deals with the signal. And there is a, through a electrocopleography, we can measure what's going on within the cochlea, and that gives us a good answer. So if we have a positive response on electrocopleography, that's a definitive diagnostic indicator. Everything else we're making a guess at. And the thing is, is that when we do this test, the patient has to be symptomatic. So you tell the patient, when they're feeling their worst, come in the office, and we'll do an evaluation. And we'll do our measurements between emesis episodes. So it's a challenging test to do, and not any fun for the patient. Next, the most uh, one of the most common vestibular problems, which I call rocks loose in your head. So the otolith organ with the calcium carbonate crystal sitting on top of the beta jello, when you move your head. It gives linear acceleration, tells your brain how fast your head is moving and the plane that it's moving in, okay? <coughs> what commonly can happen, these rocks are commonly replaced. We don't understand how, how fast they're replaced, what happens to them when they leave, but we do have calcium carbonate crystals get sloughed off into the otolith. And if there's too many sloughed off due to a number of reasons, these rocks then, through head movement, move out of their area of influence and move into the semicircular canals. And they then pile up against one of the cupula, one of the gates within the semicircular canals. And when you put your, when you move your head and put your head in a different position, to make it simple, the rocks hold the gate open and tells your brain they're still moving, which then causes you to spin for a very brief episode. <clears throat> so you go to look up to change a light bulb. You put your head up, and then after a couple of seconds, then things start spinning. Common complaint, patients lay down in bed, and the world starts spinning. They go to look under a cabinet, and the world starts spinning. It's a brief episode, lasting anywhere from 10 seconds to a minute at most. <clears throat> And if they stayed in that position, which most patients don't, if they stayed in that position, it would stop yeah. until they move again. And then you start spinning again. So if you see a patient and they complain that every time I do this, I get dizzy, it may be cervical, but it's more, most commonly benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, or BPPV. The beautiful thing is, it's easy to fix. When I see a patient for evaluation, and I find this condition, I actually treat them right then and there. And they are better the next day. So I have significant powers in making people better in this regard. It's like a laying on of hands, commonly prescribed and done by PTs, that works amazingly well. Patients may suffer for this for a couple of years before they finally hear about it and come in and see me. I fix them, they're better the next day. And people don't, with this kind of problem, many people don't lay down in bed. They lay semi reclined for years because they're fearful of the vertigo. Or they don't do certain activities. Or they do the activity like getting up on the roof to clean the gutter and they look up at something going by and then they end up on the ground. <clears throat> I 
like a friend of mine that was a physician that was out of practice for a number of months due to the injuries that they suffered from falling off the ladder. Okay, how do we measure all this stuff? Well, you're not going to tell us how you fix them? <laughs> I'm coming to you. Coming. <laughs> well, the way I fix them is that I lay the patient down and I move their head in a very specific, particular maneuver and actually get the calcium carbonate crystals to come around the corner of the semicircular canal and out of the area of influence. Mm. Now, many patients have heard about this treatment, or they see it on YouTube, they try it on their own, and they get partial displacement, partial clearance, or they move their head the wrong way, and now they've got the crystals in a different canal. And so now, they don't have a problem when they do this, but they have a problem when they do that. So treating yourself is not necessarily effective. So how do we test patients coming in? Well, first thing we do is we have them fill out an obnoxiously long questionnaire. And we review that questionnaire with the patient. And if that questionnaire determines which test we're going to do. If a patient comes in and says, every time I do this, I get dizzy, I'm not going to put them through a big test. I'm going to take them in the back and do the flip and dip and see if they're symptomatic. And treat them right then and there. So we do, patients have chronic balance issues, we do movement evaluations, we, took a look at their, we take a look at their gait, we do a test called the Tinetti Get Up and Go, they sit in a chair and we ask them to get up quickly, walk quickly, turn around and come back and sit down. And that, that assesses what their postural stability is, it takes a look at whether there's communication errors proprioceptively, we do a test called posturography, which is a fun test for me to do. I put the patient in a harness so they don't fall and hurt me. They stand on a platform. They have a visual surround and the platform. The walls move and the floor moves. Hmm. And we take a look what strategies the patient uses to maintain their balance. And if they, if they have an error, they're using the wrong strategy or they're orienting themselves inappropriately. Their center of gravity is off and the strategies for maintaining the balance are compromised, and we can evaluate that. Another test we do is called video nystagmography. We put on some infrared video goggles and record what their eyes are doing. Their eyes are the insight into the ears. So we have them follow objects displayed on the wall and see how well their eyes are able to track the objects. We put them in different positions and measure what their eyes are doing in the different positions. We then stimulate them with warm and cool air and change the viscosity within the fluid in the vestibular system and measure the response. When we warm up the fluid, the system fires faster and tricks the brain into thinking you're turning around in a circle and we measure what your eyes are doing. And here's an example of that, hopefully. That's not normal. <laughs> so when the patient has fixation, they lock onto the image, they're not moving. When we, when we cover their eyes, their eyes start moving, we can make that recording. Another interesting technology that's come out in the last two years is a huge game changer for me, and actually would be a perfect thing to use in every emergency room in the country, is called video head impulse testing. It helps us tell us if it's a vestibular problem or a central problem. Are they having a CVA or is it just a vestibular problem? So you can eliminate the MRI, the CT, all the cardiology measures. If you can measure this on the patient, you see an abnormality, you know it's an ear problem. Send them to somebody for appropriate diagnosis and treatment. Don't keep them in the hospital, send them home. If you're not gonna do any good for them, treat them in the hospital. Video head impulse is we take the patient's head and we move their head quickly from side to side in different directions and record with a high-speed video camera and accelerometer what their head is doing versus what their eyes are doing. It should be exactly opposite. When you turn your head to the right, your eyes should move equally that amount to the left. If it doesn't, then you've got an error in your system. Here's an example of an abnormal V-head. So when I move the patient's head, their eyes should just move directly over to the side. You see here, there's a little dip when the head is moved to the side. Because the eyes are not recognizing the quickness of the head movement 
and there's a hitch in the giddy up. There's a delay in the eye movement. The eye recognizes that through input from the brain and then makes a corrective movement. Nailed it right then and there. It's a very, very effective measure. <clears throat> we also do other tests that uh, we attach electrodes to a patient's neck. <coughs> We put an obnoxiously loud sound to the ear and performed a test called vestibular evoked myogenic potential. We do it cervically, and we also do an ocular measure. We put a loud sound to the ear, it has nothing to do with measuring their hearing. We stimulate the vestibular system, and that stimulates the otolith organ. Just through the pressure wave hitting that system, stimulates that and sends a signal to make a muscle contraction, and we measure that contraction. We compare and see if it's there or not there. The same thing happens when a loud sound goes in, uh, the eyes jump up and down, we can measure that response. So that helps us identify, is this a vestibular problem? Is this a central problem? Is it a proprioceptive issue? Or is it a visual issue? So we're going to refer the patient on to the appropriate uh, group for further assessment if they're not a vestibular patient. If they are a vestibular patient, we're going to give advice to the physician, you need to take them off this medication, and before they come to see me, they have to get off the medication because it masks over what I'm looking for. To refer back to the physician and say, remove them off the medication, get them to physical therapy for appropriate treatment. Physical therapy is the most effective treatment for balance disorders, whether it's a vestibular or a proprioceptive problem. So medically, if they're ruled out, send them to the PT and they can get treatment. So some of the things that are done is special exercises based on what the problem is. After an injury, there may be a communication now between the vestibular system and the eye. So when you move your head back and forth in space, there's a delay in response. We actually can, through eye exercises and head movement exercises, correct that disparity and get your eyes to lock onto the image as you're moving in space. So it's called gaze stabilization therapy. Very effective for those with, with uh, vestibular neuropathy, vestibular neuritis. And that's one of the things I did to make myself better. I'd sit at a stoplight, and I'm sure people wonder what the hell I was doing, but I would shake my head back and forth and read out loud the license plate number of the guy in front of me and the guy over here. Cognitively, if I said it out loud, it works better, but I'm causing my brain to lock onto the image when my head's in motion. It makes it strange when you're looking at somebody behind you doing that. <laughs> but if you have a loss of function, then you have to treat, teach the brain to compensate for that loss. And through physical therapy treatment, very effectively can improve that. The other problem is, as you get older, you're at risk for falling. And when you fall after age 80, if you fall the same time, in the, if you fall twice the same year, you're not going to be there next year to celebrate your next birthday. You've got a 50% chance of not being there to celebrate your next birthday. It's not the consequences. It's the consequence of the fall. It's not the fall itself. So, fall prevention is really important when referring patients for, for treatment. So, physical therapy folks will treat that patient, do a home visit, and determine where the problems and what we got to get out of the room, make them better. The most common places to, for people to fall is their front door. <laughs> Not always is the lighting great. You may be carrying packages, you've got your keys to open the front door, you're stepping over a threshold, you may have a screen door to hold, you're going down. <clears throat> That's my story, and as I say, I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Whether it's been yours, it's the allergic response or not allergic response, it's certainly all open the bay. Is there some utility in imaging procedures in diagnosis here? CT or MRI or PET scans, or do they play any role in MRI is very effective at eliminating a mass surrounding that nerve. 
So the Stigler schwannoma is, is many times identified with imaging studies. So we're going to find a reduced response on caloric measures of EMG. The V hit is going to be off, and that's the V hit is going to tell me whether it's superior or the inferior vestibular nerve to look at an MRI. So imaging studies are very valuable in certain conditions, but it's not it's not the first step in the process. Again, people may have metabolic issues, they may have endocrine issues that are causing problems with orientation. So those may be an excellent referral for patients. Everything is not fixed through physical therapy, but everything can be, most everything can be identified through assessment. Sending a patient for treatment is not a good way to diagnose the patient. So it's better to do a simple evaluation, find out where the problem is, and then make the appropriate referral from there. Don't send them to PT and see if they get better. It's not a good way to diagnose a patient. Yes. You said vestibular neuritis can go on for years. Is there a point, if somebody's had it for four or five years, that it's irreversible, physical therapy is not going to bring you back? Vestibular neuritis is usually, the response to that is usually a one-time event. And usually the consequences of that are are then and there. So it doesn't keep coming back and coming back and coming back. The consequence of the original insult has long-term consequences for compensation. So if a patient has vestibular neuritis, that then needs to get work through physical therapy to, to compensate for the lost function. So if a patient has vestibular neuritis, it doesn't keep coming back every couple of years. That is something else altogether. So the consequence of that through compensation, you lose the function, it, it's not coming back. Mm -hmm. But you can retrain the brain to compensate for that lost data. Is there still any place for ablation of the nerve? People have intractable vertigo. They, there, are, there is surgery that you go through and, and plug one of the semicircular canals um, to when they have vestibular schwannomas, you may have to sacrifice the nerve, and then they're spinning like a top in all directions for at least a month until compensation can occur. Um, cochlear implant. Patients who receive cochlear implants, when you go and disturb the system, that actually, the greatest consequence of that is the patients are, are vertiginous for a month or more after implantation. So that can happen and happens very commonly for a patient with cochlear implantation. Thank you very much. Yeah. 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 Yeah.